Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to tonight's Facebook Live. Thank you for joining us on such a glorious summer's evening. Uh, tonight's event is called Healing Wounds Under 100 Days, and our fantastic speakers, uh, John McRobert, Julie Stanton, Pam Cooper, and Professor David Gray, are with me now. Good evening, all. Hope you're well. Good evening. Good evening. Thanks for joining me. Um, guys, as you can see, our speakers are presenting remotely tonight, so if we have any technology please bear with us. I promise you we'll get it sorted as soon as possible. Um, the link for your certificate of attendance, which counts towards revalidation, will be available towards the end of tonight's show. Slides are available for download on our website, woundcare-a.com. Um, as our speakers will agree, the more involved you are tonight to them and the event, let us know who you are, where you're from, what you do. But also, please ask any questions uh, answer as soon as possible towards the end. Um, before we start, thank you to our partners tonight, to our Pioneer Wound Telehealth. This is the first time we've ever had a partnership with a service. So a massive thank you to everyone at Pioneer, one for sharing your insights tonight, um, for your commitment to innovation. But also a massive thank you for all the help um, you're giving patients around the UK and for the wounds you're healing. So without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to introduce my friend, Professor David Gray. Over to you, David. Thank you very much, Edward. Good evening, everyone. Um, uh, strange not to be able to see you, but we're getting used to these kind of presentations, so I'm conscious you're all out there. Um, so healing patients in under, in, in under 100 days might sound fanciful, it might sound unrealistic. Um, and I think that, that our key aim at Pioneer, and I'll explain who we are in a second, is to give every patient the opportunity to heal in under 100 days if healing is possible. That's our aim. We're not always going to achieve it, but we're definitely going to give it our best shot to give the patient that opportunity. So we're a third party provider of NHS services. That's what we do. Um, we have a 20 year, over a 20 year history in Sussex, a heritage there of providing third-party provider services in wound healing and lymphedema. We have centres across Sussex, the main one being a 12-room centre in, in Eastbourne. In the team, um, we've got over 15 years of telehealth experience across the UK and globally. Um, and what we've done is, is taken the lessons that we've learned in the centres in Sussex and turn them into a service which is provided via telehealth. So what we're doing is coming alongside existing providers, exist either generalist or specialist centres, and my colleague Julie Stanton will talk about our experiences um, shortly uh, later on this presentation. But the whole idea is that we use our team, uh, we have over 64 people in the team, we use a team to come alongside existing providers we stay for nine to 12 months and we act as a support to the staff and those providers using telehealth to take on challenging cases, to support with caseload reduction, um, help with healing rates. And at the end of the nine to 12 months, what we've got is a, is a staff who've had on the job education, worked alongside experts, developed their own skills, feel empowered. And, and that's our legacy is to leave staff empowered so they can continue to deliver uh, fantastic care. There's a lot of services recovering from COVID um, uh, and, and that kind of thing. So that's where we've been working recently. So we work alongside, um, <clears throat> excuse me. So if, if, I, if I draw your attention to my slide, that's where we get into the nitty gritty of, well, how do we achieve healing in under a hundred days? And, and John McRobert is gonna present you some data from our wound healing and lymphedema centers. Pam Cooper is going to present you some data from our telehealth service to care homes. And these are, these are data sets that last many years, so they're not flash in the pan. And Julie Stanton's gonna finish up describing data and outcomes relating to our most recent um, uh, support service in England um, uh, with a specialist service. So to to achieve those healing rates, we ensure that all of our team undertake formal training in both wounds and lymphedema. I think if you ever have a spare 15 hours, chat with Julie Stanton about just how important that link is. We are hugely uh, grateful for her input in these areas, but having a dual trained team is really important to us. 
structuring our assessments and treatment plans around a nine-step process. There's nothing smart in there. There's nothing unique. It's all based on evidence. There's no secret sauce. But what it means is it doesn't matter who you see in our team. We're going to be communicating along the same, the same framework. We're going to communicate to each other in the same way. We maintain a programme of, of ongoing education and competency frameworks. And that's about ensuring that perhaps work has, we, we haven't seen so much of one particular case. We haven't needed those skills. But we need to make sure that if the patient's treated by a member of our team, they have the competency to deliver that care. And finally, and Joan will talk to this very strongly, is supporting the patients to understand their underlying condition and that they're being given the best opportunity to heal, an honest conversation with them to explain what do we want to achieve for you? And we want this, this wound to be a temporary experience and healed as quickly as possible. Now, as will be discussed in the presentations, we don't always achieve our aim, but we always ensure the patient's going to get the best opportunity. So I mentioned earlier we have 64 Pioneer staff Everyone's role is related to clinical. So we have a huge backroom staff We're dealing with HR, with training, with finance, with strategy, et cetera. But everyone's role is hugely relevant to what happens when a member of our staff puts hands on a patient. So we don't, we don't have divisions. We recognize that everyone's contribution is hugely relevant to what that comes to the outcome. And what I'd like to do is to acknowledge our colleagues in Sussex who, who stayed open through COVID. They were fortunate enough to be able to stay open, but they had enormous risk to themselves. We're very grateful for everything they did during that time. It was incredible. So I'm now going to pass on to my colleagues and, and I'll leave it to you to work out whose ages I'm hinting at. But between the four of us, we have over 115 years of experience in specialist practice. I, of course, have just been there for five years. I might look so young, um, uh, but I'm going to pass on to John now, who's going to talk about clinics, Pam, who's going to talk about care homes, and Julie, who's going to talk about our collaboration in telehealth. And um, I thank you for your attention. And now I'll pass on to you, John McRobert, Clinical Director in the Wound Healing and Lymphedema Centres in Sussex. Thank you. My name is John. <clears throat> I am the Clinical Director for the Sussex uh, Clinics. Uh, the next 10 minutes, eight minutes, I'm going to talk to you about the results that we achieve and how we achieve them. So we are a nurse-led team that's based in Sussex, and we have a genuine interest bordering on uh, unhealthy obsession with wound healing, uh, and the outcomes of that real interest. Uh, our teams achieve some excellent wound healing times. We have a very basic wound philosophy in our clinics. We believe that thorough assessment leads to an accurate diagnosis of the wound, which would lead to the correct treatment first off. Wound bed preparation is very important. Management of low edema, um, edema is essential. And agreeing and talking with our patients and agreeing on a plan uh, is key to getting everything right for them. So where are we? We are peppered through <laughs> Mid-Sussex, we're in Crawley, Horsham, East Grinstead, Burgess Hill, and we have a, a large standalone clinic in Eastbourne. All our patients come from direct referral of GPs or into community from the community services. Depending on what clinic um, our staff are working from, they're either clinic based, community based, or both. So, over the last eight years, we've developed as a team into a group of hybrid nurses. Um, I'm fully aware that we're not the first nurses to do more than uh, two things. But we believe that that has um, given us a really good knowledge of both wound bed preparation and limb edema. And putting them both together uh, allows us to achieve some really good results. So we have the knowledge and confidence to compress quite aggressively. So why do we use a wound lymph approach? We know that a large number of community patients um, have chronic edema, um, and we know that a significant amount of these um, have uh, a significant amount of these have leg ulcers. So we use effective compression to try to manage the edema and try to reduce the fibrotic tissue and manage the fibrosis that covers not only the wound bed but surrounding the wound bed to try and heal up the patient's wounds quicker. Our strategy comes in two parts. The lymph part, which involves aggressive compression, bandaging, 
using foam and strapping to increase the effectiveness of the, the compression and not being too scared to go thigh length with application of bandaging to effectively manage the edema of the knee and above and avoiding the muffin top knee. The second part is uh, the healing strategy is the wound part. And from there, we, we go in for very early, quite aggressive debridement from the start. Uh, and then every visit, if possible, our patients uh, receive curatage to make sure we can get the wound as clean as possible. Uh, and on top, and mixed with that, we make sure we're using the best dressings to get the best um, environment for the wound to heal in. At the same time, we also like to sit our patients down and talk to them about what the options they have uh, and how they can help themselves to heal. And that includes things like nutrition, skin care, skin care smoking, if, if anyone still smokes, um, to try and give them the best uh, chance of giving us the best chance of them healing. We've fostered really good um, relationships with our vascular partners in Sussex, the plastic department, surgeries and dermatology. And we, we do believe in maintaining a very friendly, calm environment in our clinics, of which one is behind me. And it's very friendly and calm at the moment because I'm the only person here. Um, but even when it's, it's busiest, we try to make sure the patients feel comfortable here and, and want to be here and trust being here. Uh, and in that way, it helps us reduce any concordance issues that we may have, and it gives the patient enough uh, confidence to know that they can approach us with any problems, um, and we're going to try and help them as much as possible. So what's the result of all this um, two-pronged attacks uh, on wound healing? We looked at the, the healing data that we have. We initially looked at our uh, healing data from Mid-Sussex between 2000 and 2019. So this was a six year period where we had 1,015 referrals um, for venous leg ulcers, PLU. Out of those 1,015 patients, 874 were healed and discharged. The mean time to healing of about 117 days from an average for 17 visits. Um, when we looked uh, at, at healing rates um, a little bit more recently, we looked at our 220 and 221 healing rates. And this part of this was uh, peak COVID. And like David has said, none of our clinics closed. Um, all patients were seen, some guys. Uh, and, and we tried, like everybody else, was trying to keep everything as normal as we possibly could. So in 2020, we found that the mean days of healing had actually reduced to 79.9 days with an average of 16 visits. And the VLU patients healed into charge was 88% for that year. In 2021, we found that the mean days to healing was 77.9, 80 days. The average number of visits of 15 um, and the VLU patients were healed into charge for 89%. So, as I said, for eight years, we have tried very hard to develop a unique, maybe not unique, but looking at wound care from a different angle uh, and a different approach to try and achieve the best healing, uh, the best wound healing outcomes we can. As far as I'm aware, we're the, one of the only teams that are publishing um, the results as we are. And I do look forward to a time when all the other teams around the UK start publishing data so we can see what's going on and what we're doing so well. Uh, and that will ultimately help uh, all the patients who have to suffer um, chronic wounds. I will now pass you over to Pam Cooper, who's our nurse director for our telehealth service. Many thanks, John. <clears throat> Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for your time this evening. I appreciate, as Ed alluded to, that it's a lovely summer's evening. Um, and one of the first nice evenings that we've had in a long time. So it's much appreciated that you're taking the time to listen here. I'll try and keep it as brief as possible. Um, what I would like to share with you is some of our outcomes from our telehealth service that we provide to the nursing homes within the Eastbourne area. So we provide telehealth utilizing um, clinical nurse specialists that support the nursing homes in managing the patients that are referred to us from Eastbourne, Hailsham, and Seaford. 
This service was um, initially contracted by the CCG following a clinical incident within a nursing home. And what happened was is that they recognised that there wasn't an equitable service between patients that were ambulatory that could um, access the clinics as opposed to those that are cared for in nursing homes that didn't have access to the services. So the service was commissioned to support them, utilising the telehealth model and providing them with access to a tissue viability nurse specialist. So over a three year period from um, it was May 2017 to April 2020, which included the first quarter of um, COVID in 2020, we had 579 patients referred to us um, over that three year period. Our methodology for the telehealth is one of simplicity. The patients are referred using the uh, simple referral form and that referral comes in from the nursing home and it's usually supported with clinical images. Those um, referrals and images are triaged by the tissue viability nurse consultant, who then will liaise with the healthcare support worker based on that triage process, and our healthcare support workers will go out and assess the patients within the nursing home setting. So they provide us with a bit more of a holistic um, assessment of the patient. So they're seeing the patient within the environment, and they're able to carry out a, a more comprehensive assessment and take some more clinical images. Those images are then uploaded onto the system along with any referral uh, review data and then the tissue viability nurse consultant then will then um, review, probably liaise with the nursing home staff as well. The vast majority of our, our communications is, is um, via the telephone and what happens is, is that the tissue viability nurse consultant will liaise with the nursing home staff direct to form a more um, holistic um, pattern of the patient's um, health and well-being. So that is then reflected in the care plan. A care plan is then provided and is then um, taken to the care home by the healthcare support worker with the first dressings, because we recognise within the care home setting that there's often a significant delay in the delivery of a treatment plan uh, um, and then waiting for the dressings to come. So we've know, we know from experience that there can be anywhere from seven to 21 days that nursing home staff often have to wait for the dressings. So to try and reduce the risk to the patient and get them on a, a trajectory of um, healing or well-being, then it's important that we um, precipitate that delay by ensuring that there's um, the dressings are provided. Um, to um, share with you some of the data that we've got, um, we have 579 patients, as I alluded to before, and they're broken down into three cohorts. There is um, 92 patients that present that were lost to follow up. And the vast majority of those patients were actually tra uh, discharged home. So they obviously were probably in for respite care. The, the second largest group of patients were those that were referred on to specialist services. So those patients that required dermatology, vascular, um, plastics, or um, diabetic food services. And then the two large cohorts of patients is, is that the, we've got 253 patients that um, unfortunately passed away, and we've got 234 patients that healed. So if you look at that um, cohort of patients, um, minus the 92 that um, were lost to discharge, you've got a, a fairly even split of patients that in that high risk um, patient cohort that either healed or passed away. And that needs to be reflected in how we approach them in regards to the referral process and in regards to our care plans. So the data demonstrates that those patients that healed, 40% of them healed within a mean of 103 days. So going back to the heading of this session, trying to heal within um, 100 days, you can see that 40% of those patients within a care home setting that having been triaged and identified as um, having healing potential can heal provided by um, uh, an appropriate care plan supported by the collaboration between the clinical nurse specialist and the nursing home staff. What we also need to recognise is that 44% of patients passed away. And of that 44%, 75% uh, um, uh, of them died within 100 days, which leads to the point, which is, is that the vast majority of patients will either fall into the healing category or they will fall into the end of life pathway. And when you look at pathways of care, there's very little that reflects end of life. But what we need to recognise is, is that by supporting the staff within the care home, the tissue viability nurses recognise that some patients that will present that are end of life. 
And when we look at the wound etiology, the vast majority of patients present um, with pressure ulcers. So in the healed category and in the, um, in, in the passed away category, the vast majority of patients present with um, pressure ulcers, which is recognised um, in other studies and other literature that um, patients um, present with these um, skin changes. But what we need to um, determine is, is that for those patients that will heal, um, you can see that there is healing occurring in patients that present with grade two, grade three and grade four pressure ulcers. And by the um, tissue viability nurse recognising that through the assessment that that patient has got the capacity to heal, then the care plan will reflect that. So it will look at debridement, it will look at um, infection, it will look at reducing the risk of infection, look at nutrition, continence and pressure reduction care. In those patients that passed away that present with pressure ulcers, we need to recognise that those pressure ulcers usually occur because of the skin changes that are caused by end of life skin changes. And therefore you're not going to treat them in the same way. You're not going to treat them with aggressive debridement, but what you're going to do is treat them with um, a plan that reflects that the aim is to provide the patients on that journey with dignity. So you're managing their symptoms. So you're managing the risk of infection. You're managing the exudate. You're managing the, uh, the odor. You're managing their pain levels. So the interventions will be very different from the healing category because you're looking at providing a dignified end to that patient by supporting them with an appropriate care plan. I would just like to share with you one of our successes. And this was an 84 year old lady that was admitted from um, an acute hospital having been admitted with um, small bowel obstruction and condition. She presented with initially an unstageable pressure ulcer. And after a two week period, um, this was debrided. And you can see that we've now got some slough present there's a small bony prominence at the top of the wound and over 140 days with the tissue viability nurse supporting the nursing home um, staff and collaborating with them to ensure that the care plan reflects the care needs of that patient that you can see that that wound um, successfully healed. And what I would just like to conclude with is, is that telehealth has enabled specialists to provide an equitable service and I think it's key that we emphasise that it's about equitability that patients, it doesn't matter which care setting that they're in, that they are entitled to an equitable service. And by ensuring that the nursing home staff have got access to tissue viability nurses that they can call upon, then the patients, be they in the healing category or the end of life category, are treated with the utmost respect and are supported on the appropriate um, care pathway. I would just now like to hand over to our um, Director of Nursing, Julie Stanton. Hello, um, my session is really looking at uh, partnership working um, and this is actually looking at the service that we replicated with an NHS partnership trust. So in late 2021, we entered a contractual partnership with an NHS trust to support their existing tissue viability services in wound care across the city. What had happened is a tissue viability service had identified that their existing service position was hindered by this large number of patients with non-healing chronic wounds. And this had led them to a very large waiting list of patients just waiting to access clinic. So what we did, we actually worked with them to actually look at the type of service that they actually needed. And we tend to look at um, the patients that, that were on that chronic caseload. So we had 128 patients were identified and referred to Pioneer and we triaged them into the following three categories, which I'll talk through. But if you just look at the pie chart on the, on the right hand side, what we're actually looking at is the breakdown of the numbers of, of types of wounds that we actually had. And one of the interesting things, and one of the things that you'll see threaded through all the presentations that we have, is that we see an awful lot of patients with lymphovenous disease. And in this particular cohort of the 113 patients with leg ulcers, we had 96 patients with lymphovenous disease and only 13 patients with a straightforward VLU. And the way that we were with this hybrid with method actually um, ends up with patients healing a lot quicker um, because they're putting them onto the right treatment pathways. So if we look at just our category one, these are maintenance pathways, and I'll, I'll go through each of, of the numbers that we had in each of these categories a little bit later. But these patients are ones that present with barriers to conventional healing. So what we do with these patients is it's a multidisciplinary report with a maintenance plan 
which is provided to the referrer with guidance to the GP as to the suggested sort of types of treatment and management. So we do a full assessment and then we do it up to about nine um, follow ups. And what we try to do with these patients is aim to manage their sort of complications and symptoms where possible and try, if possible, to try and get them into uh, a healing trajectory of sorts. And the second category is a specialist referral. Again, a very few patients go into this um, category, but we do have a specialist board working with Pioneer, which will actually review the patients for us. And it's made up of specialist consultants, so plastics, lymphedema, vascular, etc. And what they do is they provide a comprehensive report, which is then sent to the referring clinician and the GP. And they, the GP will then use this as a basis for onward referral um, to the relevant team within the, the contracted organisation that we're actually working working with. So if we look at the, the main category, which makes up about 70% of the patients that we see, this is the category threes. These are the clinical treatment pathways. And the definition for these are non-healing wounds with standard, fairly standard wound etiologies with no real significant barriers identified. And what we do with these patients is we do a full um, assessment on triage and we develop what we call a bespoke individualized treatment plan, um, which is sent to the referring clinician. And there's lots of information there's rationale behind the care plans and why they're doing something. We provide detailed information on all the techniques that we're asking them to introduce. We send a lot of patient information leaflets and guides for staff. So it's actually the care plans are backed up by a lot of information that goes out to the, the referrers. Um, and what I'd like to sort of discuss now really is, is the, the, the treatment plans. What these treatment plans are is we put them in for about four weeks, dependent on triaging. Um, they deliver the, the plan of care and we give them a review date. On that review date, they send us the review um, photographs back and the wound assessments back, and then we do an updated care plan. And throughout all this process, the referrer can liaise with the, the tissue mobility consultants any time that they want to on any issues with any sort of plans within the care, any problems with the patients, any concordance issues, or any change in the patient's circumstances. We also offer training on all the advocated techniques that we're, we're putting into our care plans, as long as we've got permission from um, the organisation to go into those clinics. So let's go straight on to the actual outcomes. What have we actually achieved? So with, with 128 active patients that we had, we actually had 20 that were discharged and healed, and I'll go through those in the next slide. We had 20 uh, maintenance patients, four patients that were static, and we couldn't actually move them into a healing trajectory. However, we healed 58 patients. So that trust is now left with 51 active patients within their clinic. So we actually reduced in a very short span of time their caseload by, uh, by over half. And the average time to healing was 2.6 months, which is around about 80 days. And if you consider that their previous duration of these patients' wounds were 16 months, which is 487 days, it's no mean feat. And I have to say, the nurses that we work with were absolutely phenomenal in actually putting these care plans into place and following things through. So when you look at the, the progression of patients that had the ability to heal or have healed, we actually healed 67% of them. 5% were static and 28% were, were going on to actually um, progress to heal before we left. Going back to the patients that didn't heal, because I actually think it's important to say why they didn't heal, so that people can actually understand what they have in their clinics and how things work and, and, what, and how they don't work, is we had 22 patients discharged, not healed. And those patients, one died, one went into to a nursing home, one moved out of area. Quite a lot of them went back to district nursing care because they couldn't get to clinic or practice nurses because it was easier. And two patients just declined interventions at all. And five patients went into secondary care. Maintenance patients, again, is a really, really important part of what we do and the information that we, we feed back because the service that we worked with were really able to look at why their patients weren't healing. So those 20 patients that were on a maintenance pathway, we had seven that were classed as having real concordance issues. A lot of those patients had dependency issues. So again, it was about how they liaise with social care, how they liaise with the mental health team, etc. So they were looking at ways to improve concordance with their patients. One one had arterial insufficiency, which we couldn't refer on. Two had complex lymphedema. And one of the things that really um, was highlighted with this service was that the majority of patients with chronic wounds actually had stage 2B lymphedema. Some of them had stage 3. 
and that's why we need to, to look at with this service how they develop that, that side of their service. We had two patients with mental health issues, one was self-harming, so again it was about how we liaise with the mental health team, what services were available for that trust. And seven patients had complex health issues which they were being referred to either dermatology for biopsy, vascular surgeons or other secondary care providers. So that breaks up the ones that didn't actually heal. Now, one of the things that you will all sort of say is, well, I bet they were all really easy to heal if they, they healed 58 of them. Well, one of the things that we do with the care plans as well as the patients is we put them into complexity. So we say they're either simple, moderate or complex. And the simple ones really are non-healing surgical wounds, skin tear, thenous disease with, with very superficial ulceration. The moderate were patients with a mixture of wounds under six months, clinical infections or potential biofilms present, one or two risk factors for non-healing and wounds that were under 10 centimetres squared. And the complex ones were those wound duration of over six months, wound size were over 10 centimetres squared, they had multiple comorbidities or risk factors for non-healing and a history of recurrent infection. And you may be surprised to know that when it actually comes to the actual numbers, we had one simple um, wound. We had seven moderate complex wounds. However, we had 28 that were complex. Um, we had five that we couldn't actually categorise because we didn't know how long they'd had the wound. So the majority of wounds that we healed through um, this service were complex wounds. And the next slide, hopefully, that comes up you will actually see the types of patients that we actually saw. And when you start looking at these pictures, you'll actually see that they are, um, majority of them are stage 2B, and in some cases, stage 3 lymphedema. You've got positive stemmer sign, you've got swelling to the dorsum of the foot, you've got swelling to the toes, you've got hard fibrosed edema, hard fibrotic wound beds, you've got shape distortion at the knee, uh, and all down the leg. So these patients are very, very complex. And if you treat these patients with VLU techniques, they don't respond. You have to really look at combining lymphedema techniques and venous techniques together and tissue viability, looking at curatage, looking at antimicrobial pathways, looking at the bigger picture with these patients. So let me just go on now to a case study that we did, just one case study. Um, he was a 73 year old gentleman. He'd had the wound for five years. He developed a stage three lymphedema with extensive fibrosis and what we call papillomatosis, which is that orange peel skin around his peri wound area. He suffered with uh, recurrent episodes of infection, which was made worse by the two years of sort of COVID. Wounds are present on the both medial and lateral malleoli. We commenced um, treatment in November. Uh, 2021 with quite an aggressive antimicrobial pathway, aggressive curatage, and we started him on multi-layer lymphedema short stretch bandaging in a figure of eight. We strapped him and we provided localised compression to break down the fibrosis. We put kinesio tape on to improve his lymphatic flow and we used mobilising foam pads to break down the fibrosis. And this is, is sort of all these are lymphedema techniques that we've incorporated into um, the realms of tissue viability. And if you can see the pictures of this gentleman, um, the cost of care for this, this gentleman was over the five year period was £46,836. The cost to healing um, with the service was 2654 And we healed this gentleman in 133 days. Now, I have to say a lot of the work actually in, with this gentleman goes to the, the, the team at the partnership trust they were fantastic with um, this gentleman and they put again everything we asked them into place um, and again both the patient and the nurses couldn't believe how quickly this very very complex wound that had been there for five years healed up with just changing the techniques that we used so the next slide really looks at a couple of the patients that actually healed and looks at the costings um, sort of surrounding those. So we're looking at wound duration, cost and time to healing. Um, and the average cost to healing with these patients was 2,508. And this is including sort of the, the pioneer fee per patient. Um, the average cost pre-pioneer was 5,821. So that means the total cost for the patients um, pre-pioneer was 197,924. 
Following the interventions, it was 85,281,000. So a saving potentially of 112,643,000 pounds for the 41 patients. Um, and these costs don't actually include things like antibiotics prescribing, hospital admissions, or the cost of swabs or GP appointments. This is purely just your time, nursing time, and the cost of the dressings. So you can see by just changing some of your techniques how quickly um, you can actually look at cost savings and how that can be worked back into your service. Now, the last slide you'll, you'll be glad to know is one that, that literally looks at what we actually achieved with the partnership working. Now, a lot of these, these um, were basically from the actual partnership trust themselves. This is what they said and um, they got back from the service. So the orange is basically what it, it did for patients. The green is what it did for service development. Um, the gray is for staff and the sort of the yellow is what we did in relation to costings. So if you actually look at um, the patients, we have improved outcomes and quality of life for the patients, a reduction in recurrence rates, because one of the things that this allowed the service to do was they opened up on a Wednesday, a well, a well also clinic, so they could bring the patients back that had healed, and they opened up their waiting list for clinic. One of the big things it did for service development is it gave the tissue viability nurses time to breathe, time to plan, time to really think about their services, which is what everybody needs. And it, they were, they helped, uh, we helped them to develop a business plan for lymphedema because we actually gave them the data that showed um, how many patients with lymphedema were coming to clinic. Um, they also set up a complex community clinic, a wound service. So basically with the techniques and knowledge that they'd learned, they went out into the community to help the district nurses to actually develop um, a complex wound service. Uh, so three of the nurses basically were released from the clinic to go out and work with district nurses. And one of the big things they said, it was a progression from a wound dressings clinic to a, an actual wound healing clinic, which is really important. And that leads on to the staffing issue. It improved motivation for staff as they were healing patients. It improved their, their knowledge, their skills and their education. They developed an outcomes database, which made and um, aware of what they were looking at, which patients were progressing, which ones were static, how they referred them. And it actually led to a reduction in staff sickness levels. Um, and finally, sort of costings wise, there was a massive reduction in swabs, infections and hospital admissions. And the big thing for me being an ex-district nurse was there was a reduction in the need to actually engage out of hours and bank holiday community nursing services. Um, and that was a really important one for both the trust and myself and a reduction in prescribing costs. So you can see from the work that we've done, we've, we've just basically taken what we've learned over the eight years in clinic, looking at our pathways, which are tried and tested, that you can actually achieve the healing under 100 days with the majority of patients within this um, service healing within 80 days, just by assessing and then treating them correctly. Thank you. Julie, everyone, thank you so much. Um, if you guys get a chance, please um, check the event out on Facebook because some of the comments, some of the questions that come through have been fantastic. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for your engagement and for your involvement. There's so many, so many questions that come through. We've got 20 minutes, so I'm going to try and get through as many of them as possible. So if you guys could take yourselves off mute, I'm going to um, start with question one, which is going to be for John. Um, John. This is going to answer quite a few questions that come through around concordance, around adherence. So the first question for you is, what are your patient concordance rates like? Um, I don't know off the top of my head. Actually, I would have to that something. I do. Well, David, okay. David. Yeah, I'm happy to answer that. Sorry, John, I dumped out on you because I thought we'd be busy sorting questions. Um, uh, basically, we published a paper 2016, which looked at the concordance rates around about 94 to 96%. And the most recent audit seemed to indicate we're still sitting at that level. And I apologise to everyone as I'm answering. I've gone off mute and I have a snoring dog next to me, which is a Labrador. So I apologise if you can pick that up on my microphone. Um, uh, so I think that, that the, the, the initial thoughts, and Julie really led on this back in the day, was around just as John described that that honest conversation with the patient, the support of the, the family, and an explanation that says, if you stick with this program, you're going out of here in 100 days with no wound. And then they, they build that relationship. And uh, so the concordance rates from that perspective, um, uh, when we've audited them, have been pretty high. Brilliant. Thank you. 
Uh, David, the next one's for you as well. Um, the questions are coming in now, so you have to worry about other questions from now on. Uh, this is from Joanne. Thank you, Joanne. Um, so, David, is the telehealth program going to be available for community nurses? This knowledge would be really useful. Okay. Um, can I wrap that up with is about eight or nine questions from across across the country where people have um, where pe people have been asking um, uh, about do you work in this area that area are you going to work out of England etc. So essentially, this is us launching. Um, uh, we we've had our first reference site. We've completed that. Julie's presented it, and I think that that where the our service is available will will be based upon where people invite us to get involved in the future so that's an evolving thing and everyone who's who's, who's asked that question we know where you are so we'll, we'll come back to you with an email to actually answer that question and give you more details but i think in terms of the techniques the techniques are being used by healthcare support workers district nurses specialists i think if you ever have the good fortune to attend training by by julie pam and john then what you realize is that the, the, the techniques used are broken down into really um, understandable um, uh, mechanisms so that you can replicate them. That's the key thing here is being able to replicate. I should have said, and I apologise in my first introduction, there is no secret sauce here. There's no piece of fancy tech. There's no piece of, mm -hmm. uh, of um, amazing um, technology or new wound product that's being used here. This is all about evidence-based practice and, and people being trained to do that. Hope that answers the question. Very good, thank you. So question three, um, Judy, this is for you. Um, what kind of tape do you use at the wound margins? We use a combination of techniques, really. Um, we use um, strapping techniques, which were developed by um, Accelerate. We use Kinesia tape, which is a lymphedema technique, which basically improves lymphatic flow. We also use mobilizing foam pads, which actually breaks down. It forms, it's very similar to sort of a massage technique. So once you put the pad over the area, once you put the bandage on, it will actually massage the area. So it breaks that fibrotic tissue down. And these are easily learned techniques that lymphedema nurses have been using for a long time. The training is very basic. We're not asking patients, we're not asking people to, to do manual lymphatic drainage. It's just very simple techniques that you can learn. Brilliant, thank you. I should have said up, guys, if any of you want to cut in, add, please feel free um, at any stage. So Pam, next one's for you. Um, so thank you guys for all these questions that keep coming in. Um, how do the nurses and care homes feel about the service provided? Um, <clears throat> there's the nurses that currently use the service, um, the feedback is exceptionally positive. We get lots of communication from them on a regular basis because they know that the service exists, but they also know that the tissue viability nurse consultant is always at the end of a telephone. So between the relationship that the healthcare support workers develop by going in and doing the assessments and then delivering the care plans and the dressings, and then the day-to-day um, -day support that they get from the tissue viability nurse consultant, um, the feedback is, is exceptionally positive. And it's positive in both elements of the patient cohort. So you see the staff engaging in um, identifying changes within those patients that are on the healing trajectory and coming back with um, changes in condition very quickly and identifying if things is, is slowed down or if they're accelerating, they will then re-refer back between the review dates that's been established. But also one of the key elements within identifying those patients that are end of life is, is that the support that we can give the nursing home when those patients are um, um, on the end of life pathway, when they have to, particularly those patients with pressure ulcers, when those have to be um, recorded. And what we've found is, is that we've had really, really fascinating conversations with adult social care where they've been, had this patient referred because they've got pressure damage. And what happens is, is that we can then have that conversation with them and say, you know, the nursing home has got everything in place. They've got a robust care plan. They're following the processes and the pathways. And this patient is showing these skin changes due to end of life. And I think the nursing home staff have found that exceptionally helpful because it supports them in ensuring that they are doing exactly the right thing. Um, and these patients are going along that pathway with dignity and with the appropriate care. So the feedback has always been exceptionally positive and you develop those relationships. So, you know, you have those nurses that are regularly on the phone and picking up and having a chat on a regular basis. Pam, um, thank you. Um, 
Julie, for you, this is from Susie. Thank you, Susie. What about rats? Is there a difference between them and hosiery? Um, yes and no. It, it all depends, again, going back to, to the assessment, when you're looking at the type of edema that you've got. If you've got very, very hard fibrosis edema, you need different types of wraps as well as different types of hosiery. So one of the things that, that we sort of teach is, is the differences between the soft and the stiff and that it goes for, for wraps and hosiery. You have them in soft and stiff and you have to know when to use them. And if you get the, the, the wrap or the hosiery right, matching with the edema, you'll get much better outcomes from your patients. It shouldn't be, sometimes it's formulary led, where it's actually it should be the type of edema that's actually presenting. Brilliant, thank you. John, for you from Rebecca, our main issue in my primary health, primary health care practice is pulmonary sinuses, which become chronic. Some of these have had multiple surgeries. We followed guidance and referred to tissue viability. Have you got any suggestions on what we can do for those wounds that keep breaking down? Um, the pulmonary sinuses are really, really difficult to heal up for so many reasons. A, where they are, uh, and B, how they're caused. What we find, um, <clears throat> and depending where the wound is, uh, depending how many sinuses there are, there's a lots of variables. But we've had some really good success um, with topical negative pressure uh, in our clinics. Uh, they're very difficult. It's a very difficult dressing to put on, and it's a very, very difficult dressing to keep on. But if, and it takes about two of you to do it it's quite time but that we've had you know um sinus uh, pulmonary sinus problems that have undergone surgery but very slow healers um healing up with uh, topical negative pressure we've had some very good results with that um what we do find one of the biggest challenges i'm sure rebecca finds as well is that when the uh, if the patient's gone for any kind of surgery uh, they come back and they're still not healing um, we, there's a risk uh, that we send the patient back to the surgeon because if something's not healing that we can't physically see, we need to get a surgeon in to, to review, to see if there's anything else, see if they've got everything out. Um, and to be quite honest, the majority of times that we send a patient back, they get um, the, the surgeon will take them back into the theatre, re um, re-look at the wounds, and that's usually how we heal them. We, it's a, a very close and understanding relationship between us and the surgeon. Uh, and if there's nothing the surgeon is able to do at the time, it's a case of packing, um, uh, packing wounds. If they've got any kind of seat and stitch or anything like that in them, there's that to manage. Um, but to be quite honest with you, the, the best way we've found of dealing with this we can is with topical negative pressure. John, thank you. David, um, question from Alison. Can you please advise TVNs how best to get buy-in from senior management, CCGs, ICS, please? I'm conscious um, that of time, so I'm just going to say one word, data. I think the, the difficulty is, is for a long, long time in tissue viability, we've relied on emotion and wanted people to realise how much the patients are suffering. And I think what we have to be able to do is to demonstrate through data um, what is the true impact to the ICS of wound healing or delayed wound healing? Sepsis, infection, hospital admission rates, not just the cost of dressings, because I think that, you know, that's a small, small number compared to the, the impact of patients being able to have sepsis. So I think the, the, the reality is if TVNs want to engage in a conversation with CCGs, with ICS, it has to be based around data um, and being able to communicate the true extent of the problem and challenge that, that we face. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, Violet, thank you for the next question. Pam, this is for you. Um, could I please ask Pam if her team liaise with podiatry in the management of pressure damage affects the foot and the ankle? Um, the contract within um, e, um, East Sussex is, is that we're not contracted to look at the diabetic foot ulcer. So those patients would be immediately referred back to the diabetic foot specialists um, and they would be cared for there. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, Jenny, uh, David, this is for you. How do your wound healing rates compare to elsewhere in the UK? Um, again, 
it, it, keeping it brief, um, I had a chat with um, Christy Moffat recently. You know, we, we, we're benchmarking against Christy Moffat's 1992 work. That's where we're looking to, you know, Christine demonstrated the power of the specialist clinic, the power of nurses applying compression effectively. Um, and I think they compare favorably um, or in the same area as that. Looking at other um, data sets, I think that the challenge we face is what we're doing is we're demonstrating over. So John's presented data, which essentially runs from 20, I think it's 2015 to um, 2021. So it's this long, long data set. So I think what we would really like to do is to see people producing equal data sets. And for us all to be really honest, because like if you look at some of our papers around our data sets, what we're doing is we're not hiding patients. And Julie made that point. You can find out what happens to every single one of our patients and where they go. And I would love to see us with more um, regional, local, or even national data sets where we can start to compare and contrast in the way in which, for example, orthopedic vascular surgeons do and, you know, we talk about the diabetic foot, people know what kind of amputations go on. So I think that um, that that's the, at the moment, it looks like we're favourable, but we just don't know how much great practice might be out there that's not being shared um, and data being published. Brilliant, thank you. And David, another one, and I, I know we're repeating ourselves here, but we keep getting similar questions. So is the Pioneer Telehealth Service available in Northwest area and in Manchester? Um, no, not at this moment, um, uh, but what I would say is that this is our first venture out, so we are available to to um, uh, to enter into discussions with people. We're on the SPS framework. I noticed a, a, a question earlier, a comment earlier from someone on the SPS framework. We can be contracted through the SPS framework. We'll follow up with anyone who, who's interested after this, but at the moment, um, uh, we're not active in Northwest Manchester. If anyone out there wants more information, I, either fill in the certificate at the end, we'll get your email from that, or just put your emails down now and we can introduce you to the relevant people at Pioneer who can take you through um, what their offering is and how to engage with your local management. So yeah, feel free to do that on Facebook or with a certificate. Um, so question 11, uh, Julius is for you from Shelley. Thank you, Shelley. Um, it can be difficult when you have different nurses' opinions or those that do not keep up with up-to-date practice and this can lead to conflict. How do we get around this? I think that the biggest thing for us is, is that all our nurses are trained the same. We, we do competency assessment, but they follow pathways and they don't deviate from those pathways unless they go through myself, Pam or John or David. So the, those clear pathways, they know exactly what they're doing. Um, they know exactly which, which hosiery to use, when, where, which wrap to use, when, when to use um, curatage. So we know exactly what we should be doing. And that, for me, is the key. They follow those pathways and they're all taught in the same way and they're competent. And that's the only way. If every single nurse is doing the same thing within a service, there isn't any deviation. Patients don't get confused. Concordance is better. So really, it is about those pathways and how we teach and train the staff. Brilliant. Julie, there's another one coming in from you from Jenny. What criteria do you have to help decide which patients are unable to achieve a healing trajectory? Again, we, we look at, we use sort of the complexity of it. So we're looking at the, the comorbidities. We are looking at their ability to be able to be concordant. Uh, and again, the usual things like, you know, have they got a good blood supply? Um, where the wound is there's lots of things that we actually look at and every single patient we triage in the same way and we put a care plan in and then we see whether or not that patient has the ability but we try absolutely everything before we get to that point where we think they're a maintenance patient or they're not going to heal um, so it is about mdt referral it's about thinking about what we're doing it's about following the pathways and the big thing is is the patient concordant and if they're not how can we get them to be concordant Brilliant, thank you. So we're down to our last two questions. Um, Pam, this is for you. Telehealth is the way forward, exclamation mark. Do you find good adherence to the treatment plans that are provided? This is an issue we come across regularly. Um, yes, I think the care plans are adhered to well be uh, because we have very strict um, re-review dates. So um, when the patients are, when we implement a care plan, um, we review very frequently to ensure that the care plan is followed and if there is any deviation then we ask them to contact us immediately because there may be clinical reasons for them to deviate but if they feed back to us very promptly then we can either say that that's acceptable and we amend our care plan to suit that deviation or we have um, 
that honest and frank conversations that we've just had to explain what is the rationale behind why we've suggested something. But generally, as a rule, yes, because we then measure the outcomes so we can actually traject those patients that have not had the care plan that we've suggested implemented. And therefore, then we can then feed back to organisations and say, well, actually, of those, for example, 100 patients, there was four that the care plan was deviated from, that there wasn't a clinical reason for it. And of that four, we can look at the healing outcomes and see, did those patients heal or did they um, not heal in the way that was expected? So there is an audit trail and outcome measure process that we can put in place to make sure that we um, follow those patients that there is deviations from. Um, but generally, they don't. Brilliant, thank you. Um, I wouldn't deviate from anything you told me to do, quite frankly, I've known you for 25 years. Um, so, uh, our last question, um, Alex, thank you, is for Julie. Do you have training with regards to how to apply different kinds of compression bandages? Um, I mean, a lot of the, the, the companies, I think one of the things that they need to think about is because we have such a predominance of lymphovenous disease, one of the things you have to learn is how to apply um, multi-layer lymphedema bandaging. And any of the companies that, that provide that will actually give you training. And if you can apply a figure of eight bandage, you can do it. Um, so literally, the, the, the training is there. We're just very sort of um, tailored into we have to follow the VLU pathway, whereas most of our patients aren't traditional venous patients, they're lymphovenous. So you have to change. And that training is available from um, any of the suppliers that do the short stretch bandaging. Brilliant. Thank you. And thank you for all the questions that have come in. And thank you to our speakers for answering them in such an erudite way. So much appreciated. So that concludes tonight's event. Um, the certificate link is available now, so please download that for your revalidation. Just a massive thank you from me and the teams at Wound Care today and Mole. Um, I asked for great engagement and you haven't disappointed. The questions and the comments have been flying through. Um, I'm well aware how much you know, time you've had to give up and whatever, how precious that is. So thank you so much. Um, the certificate is available. The slides are available for download as of around tomorrow or Friday on our website, so please go there. Um, so just some thank yous. Thank you to our speakers, David, Julie, John, and Pam. Massive thank you from me and the team. Uh, to everyone at Pioneer Wound Telehealth, thank you for your support. It means a great deal. To my team, um, to Mole, thank you for putting together another great event. And most importantly, um, thank you to you guys for joining. Um, it's hugely appreciated. We remain humbled by what you all do. So thank you for joining us on a sunny summer's evening. Stay safe, stay strong, and we look forward to seeing you at our next event, which is on the 28th of June. Thank you very much. Goodbye.